This video will cover paradigms, a couple of different paradigms, and methodologies for doing nursing research studies. Um, so first of all, please don't get scared away by the word paradigm. I think sometimes we hear that word and we think, oh my gosh, what does that mean? It's basically just a way of looking at the world or someone's worldview or perspective of how things work and how things are interrelated in the world that we live in. Um, so all of us have a unique perspective or outlook on nursing and life in general. And so that basically is our paradigm, but with our own individual paradigm. But within the world of nursing, there are several common paradigms that are shared among nurses. And one, the ones I'm going to present in this video are not all inclusive. There are a bunch of different kinds of nursing specific paradigms. And also, it's important to note that these aren't actually nursing specific at all. Most scientific disciplines kind of use these types of paradigms to structure their research purposes. But for the purposes of, purposes of this presentation, we're only focusing on nursing research and we're only going to focus on two distinct paradigms, the positivist paradigm and the constructivist paradigm. You'll see the word naturalists or naturalistic um, as a derivative of constructivist, they mean the same thing and are often used interchangeably. So let's dive into these and as we do, this is going to make a lot more sense to you. And you're going to realize you probably already know this already. You just didn't know that they were called by these terms. So first of all, what in the world is a positivist or a positivistic paradigm? As you can see in the little box to the side, basically, Positivism is the way that we study society or the world that relies specifically on, and I'm using air quotes, scientific evidence, because that's a point of contention, like experiments and statistical analysis to show the true nature of how people operate or how the world works. So underlying that are some assumptions. And one assumption of positivism is that there is a reality a single reality that we can study and that we can learn about through disciplined research methods, okay? So that is called the principle of determinism. That basically underlies positivism and it states that anybody who subscribes to positivism believes that there are causes to the things that we see every day. And as a scientist, I can study these outcomes and I can determine what actually caused that outcome to take place. Some common things that you see within research conducted under this umbrella of positivism is that I, as a researcher, am independent from those who I am researching. So those are my subjects. I am using them in my study to collect data to complete assessment tools or surveys. They're giving me data to answer my question. We are separate. So I am giving them information to make this an ethical study, and they are giving me information to help me answer my question. Also, a researcher who's practicing a, doing a study under the umbrella of positivism believes that they must be totally objective. They should be as they should be non-biased and we should hold our values as a person in check for the good of the research study. And then lastly, this is a very orderly disciplined process. So it's a very tightly controlled kind of study that would fall under the umbrella of positivism. Okay, um, there is a more recent version of positivism which you may read about. Uh, it's called post-positivism, kind of after positivism. And basically, this is a newer type of um, form of positivism that the, in which we finally understood, okay, maybe it's impossible to absolutely know with 100% certainty what causes a phenomenon to happen because it is completely impossible for me, a scientist, to control every single minute detail about a phenomenon that might happen. So a positivist believes that there's one answer 
and I can find the calls to that outcome. If I control this study tightly enough, I can tell you with certainty that X caused Y. A post-positivist believes in studying X and Y, and they believe in using as many controls as possible to have a tight, rigorous study, but they will, in fact, say, there's no way I can control for everything. There are going to be factors out there that can contaminate my study data. I know this. I accept this. That's the difference between positivism and post-positivism. So while a post-positivist does a Agree that I can't control everything, they still very strongly value objectivity. They still want to minimize bias, okay? And they're still looking for cause and effect, but they're not going to say with 100% certainty that X caused Y. They're going to say X probably caused Y because we've held all of these things constant. So you may have guessed, if you know anything about research at all, that the most common type of research done under the umbrella of positivism is quantitative research. Basically, if you were in school and you learned anything about the scientific method, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, it's an orderly systematic process that we use to test hypotheses, collecting data in a very orderly um, controlled manner. Um, this, the evidence that is produced you, within quantitative research is called empirical evidence, okay? And what empirical evidence is, is it's evidence that is objective, not subjective, but objective, because I'm gathering it through the senses, I'm gathering it using detailed prescriptive me methods, and it's not based on my beliefs. And the thought behind this is that if I were a researcher and I was standing right next to a second researcher, and we both had the same training and the same data collection instrument, we should collect the exact same data if we're observing a participant. So that would be objective data. It doesn't take my own personal thoughts or feelings or beliefs into account in any way. There has to be formal measurement instruments. So this is things like surveys, questionnaires, checklists for observation, in which we collect number-based numerical data that we then turn around and use statistical analysis to analyze, to test our hypotheses and answer our research questions. And the whole point of doing this kind of study is that we want to find answers to our questions so that we can generalize the findings beyond the people who are actually in our study. So while I'm learning about neuro neuropathic foot ulcers of a diabetic, I may have only had 150 people in my study, but what I hope to find by studying those 150 people is generalizable data that I can generalize beyond to other type 2 diabetics with neuropathic ulcers, not just the 150 people in my study. So no research is perfect, and no research is necessarily better than the other, as you're going to learn about in a little bit. There are problems and potential biases with all of these types of research we're going to talk about today. So one problem with quantitative research is that we have to measure everything. And that's a, a perk because we can be systematic and we can use statistical analysis, but not everything is super easy to measure and convert into a number. So think about really abstract things like stress. There are some biological manifestations of stress. So I could measure your cortisol level. Um, I could do that through serum cortisol or I could swab the inside of your cheek. Um, I can look at your changes in vital signs like your pulse or your blood pressure or look for any kinds of nervous tick or sweating. But I mean, is that that's not always super easy to do. So could, could there perhaps be a survey or a questionnaire where we ask people to rate their current level of stress or their level of stress over the past week or the past academic term if it's in a college or university setting? Um, burnout, again, it's very abstract. What does that even mean? And how can I measure that to turn that into a number? The same could be said with resilience or perfectionism, or a ton of different concepts that we can study, but we just have to define how we're going to measure it systematically to where it can be converted into a number.
it can be done, but that is a challenge that is um, inherent with quantitative research. And lastly, this is a very narrow focus of research in a very controlled situation. And that doesn't necessarily lend itself to every kind of question we want to know as a nurse. So for example, can an attitudes about foster parenting survey, let's say there's 20 questions on that survey. Will that paint a full holistic picture of all of the complex factors that surround the decision to become a foster parent? And you could definitely say the answer to that would be no. So would we necessarily want to do a quantitative study if that's the kinds of things we're wanting to learn about? Is what factors go, go into the top deciding to be a foster parent? Maybe that question would be better served using a different type of research methodology. And that kind of study would fall under the constructivist paradigm. So we had the umbrella or paradigm of positivism that says there's an answer, we can find it and we can control things so we can find cause and effect. Constructivists say, not so fast. All of us are different. We all have different realities or understandings of the world. So what I believe to be true may not be exactly what you believe to be true. And there's no way we can study it as a phenomenon where we'll find one answer that fits everyone. A constructivist would say that that would not be possible. They say that reality is individualized and it's situated within a context. And we can't just get a person under a microscope and study them and understanding them holistically because they are situated within the environment and the context. So that kind of falls under the principle of relativism. So we had determinism under the umbrella of positivism. So under this umbrella is relativism, which means the truth or reality is relative. It depends on the person. It depends on the context. So there's no one truth that we can discern by reading, by studying people. Instead, we're going to understand a broader context that's situated within the person and the environment. Um, as opposed to the researcher being separate, the researcher is very thoroughly interacting with the people who are being researched. Usually this is going to be in in-depth um, interviews. Um, or in-depth, unstructured observations of people to see what they do and how they respond to different situations. And also very different from the other kind of positivism is that the researchers are, it's okay to have your values. It's okay to be subjective because that's actually desirable in order for us to understand how all of everyone's truths fit together into different patterns. So as you may have guessed, this is definitely not quantitative research. This is more qualitative research, which focuses on understanding the experience as it's lived by each individual through different um, collection and analysis of narrative or subjective data. So it's going to be um, audio recorded or typed notes of interviews that we've done with people. And what that does is it actually shows us holistically the story behind what people do and the decisions that they make that can't be boiled down by into a 20 item survey. We're getting a bigger, richer story and understanding people's experiences as they've lived them and understood them. So it does give us in-depth narrative information that's grounded in the real life experiences of the people who are providing us data. We don't get numbers, we get words and stories. Um, so again, there are problems with this type of research as well. First and foremost, the human is the research instrument. So we don't have a 20 item survey. Instead, we have a researcher who's asking questions and we have a, a human participant who's answering the questions. And both researcher and participant bring biases into this, to the study and they bring their own unique worldview. And while that's important, we're fallible. So therein, this is a fallible type of research as is every other kind of research. Also, this is important to realize, and you've probably, you may have heard this before, um, depending on you know what, where you've gone to school or what courses you've taken, but not everyone in the scientific community, inside and outside of nursing, values or respects qualitative research because of the subjectivity. So if you've been taught the scientific method and that that is true science, 
then you've probably heard that this kind of research isn't real science. I beg to differ. This is empirical evidence that we're collecting. Most research textbooks that you would look at would not necessarily say that, but how are we gathering evidence through our senses? We're talking, we're experiencing, we're responding. This is scientific data that we're collecting. However, most of the time these are very small sample sizes. It may be very difficult to replicate the study. So if we did this study with 10 other people and asked the same interview questions, very likely you're gonna come up with different patterns or different themes from what the participants have said. And so therefore it's not as generalizable. And so for that, those reasons, a lot of times, it's not a very well respected type of study. However, not all questions that we want to know about as nurses fit themselves into the box of quantitative research. There is a ton of value for qualitative studies in defining how we relate to people, how we understand them, how we grow our emotional intelligence and our sub, um, sympathy and empathy. So those things come from there. Um, so you'll see that quantitative studies tend to be deductive and qualitative studies tend to be inductive. And I've put a few examples on here. I'm not gonna read all of this. I recommend that you pause the video at this point and read the descriptions here. But then what I will say is that most of the time in a quantitative study, we're developing a broad hypothesis that we assume to be true for the whole population. And then we're studying our small group of people to see if the hypothesis holds true. So we're looking at, this is a top down or decreasing our focus. So broad general hypothesis and then decreasing it to study the people in our sample. Whereas inductive is we're increasing our focus. So we're observing and interviewing a small group of people and we're learning what they're saying and then we're using that data to actually create hypotheses that could be studied later on or to create a theory that explains this for a broader population. So I have examples, again, pause it, read that. I'm not gonna read that directly off of this slide. Um, here's another way to look at it. So a quantitative study, deductive reasoning, starts with a theory. That theory lends itself to development of hypotheses that come from the theory. Then we do our data collection and observation from our participants to either confirm um, that the, the hypothesis was correct or fail to confirm that the hypothesis was correct. And inductive, we're increasing our focus. So we observe our, our small group of participants in our study. We see patterns from the interviews that we've had with that small group of people. And from that, we can develop tentative hypotheses and eventually theories. So it's completely backwards. Increasing focus, decreasing focus. Um, this is just a quick little table to kind of sum up everything I've said thus far. Quantitative is on the left. Again, that falls under the positivist umbrella. And qualitative falls under the constructivist umbrella for the most part. Um, I'll talk at the very end of this about a couple of other paradigms that you probably may read about elsewhere. Um, I'm not reading all of this, but basically I just said quantitative is deductive. So start with a hypothesis and test it. Um, qualitative is inductive, so we start with the participants and their data and we develop a hypothesis. Um, again, quantitative is very objective and structured, fixed, non-flexible. Qualitative is very much subjective and it's emergent, flexible designs. We can be flexible and that's okay. Um, qualitative embraces the context in which the person lives. Quantitative studies tries to control that context. So we could find the cause and effect of our outcome. Um, so again, the data is different. We have numerical data, we have narrative data. You can look at all of this by pausing. Um, I'm not going to go through each individual component so as to keep this video from being so long. Um, but it's important, we've talked about the contrast, the differences, but how do they compare and what similarities do they have? First, there's no such thing as a perfect research study. There's no such thing as a perfect quantitative study, nor is there such thing as a perfect qualitative study. As I discussed earlier, both have their limitations. 
but both of them start with the research questions and then they gather data to answer that question. They both rely on human cooperation, which means they both have to have ethical considerations and principles in place to protect the people who are participating in the study. And again, they're both fallible. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect, completely unbiased, non-errant study. So how do we know which kind of study design to use? It all depends on the question that we want to ask. So if we're interested in finding the answer to this first example question, that definitely would have to be quantitative. We would have to give one group of participants cryotherapy and the other would not get cryotherapy. So we could see how cryotherapy had an influence on the mucositis of the patients who have gone underwent chemotherapy. The second example question is definitely a qualitative study because you see the context and the holistic picture that we want to paint. We can't boil that down to a simple questionnaire not to answer that particular question. So here are some examples. These are actual um, journal article, research article titles. And most of the time, if you read an article title, you can discern for the most part whether it was quant or qual. So the lived experience of parental caregiving to a dying child, that's very context specific. We're not gonna be able to do a survey and get the full picture to that question. So that would be qualitative. The prevalence of depression in nursing homes, prevalence equals statistics, right? The percentages and frequencies of something. So that would definitely be quantitative. We would be looking at numbers. The effect of exercise on cardiovascular functioning. Anytime you see the word effect, you know we're looking at cause and effect. So that's definitely gonna be quantitative. That would not be qualitative. Um, predictors of length of stay in hospital among maternity patients. Anytime you see the word predictors, it's probably, they're not 100% always, but probably going to be quantitative. We're looking at relationships among variables to see which variables are related to length of stay. Struggling through the process of adapting to widowhood, that's not a survey kind of study. That's gonna be an intimate interview kind of study to look at the full holistic picture. So that's gonna be qualitative. The meaning of hope in patients waiting for a donor organ. If you see the word meaning, you pretty much almost 100% know it's qualitative. You can't understand the meanings behind something if you're looking at it under a microscope with a small controlled study. Um, a few more factors that contribute to risk-taking behaviors in low-income adolescents. This is almost the same thing as that predictors um, example I showed you earlier. We're looking for which variables are related to increased risk-taking behaviors. So that's definitely going to be quantitative. Um, surviving SARS insider's perspectives the whole insider's perspectives tells you that's qualitative you're going to be hearing their stories of what it was like to live with that um, condition and how they survived it uh, meanings of menopause to rural appalachian women there's that word meanings again so we know that's qualitative and lastly the effect of oral support measures on growth patterns of very low birth weight infants see that word effect so we know it's quantitative so again, I just said I was going to mention a couple of other paradigms. There is a critical theory research, which often falls under the umbrella or paradigm of feminism. There is um, postmodernism. There's a ton of other different paradigms. The purpose of this video is not to go over every single paradigm out there. The main two disciplinary uh, science, the main two research methodologies are quantitative and qualitative. There's a bunch of different types of designs up underneath that. We'll talk about that in a different video. That's not the point of this video, but hopefully you have a better understanding of the differences between positivism and constructivism, and likewise, quantitative and qualitative research after visit viewing this video. So thanks for listening.